All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Let's talk about chaos engineering. So I don't know um, if anyone noticed this last week, but there was uh, an essay posted to um, The Atlantic by Ian Bogost. He's a uh, professor uh, of computer science at Georgia Tech. Uh, it was almost more of a rant than an essay about how programmers, uh, at least some programmers, shouldn't refer to themselves as engineers. Uh, and interestingly, Bogost is not a software engineering researcher. He does computer science and media. He's written some interesting things about video games. Um, I'm not here today to talk about whether a programmer should call themselves engineers or not. I think it's a really fascinating topic, and if you want to talk you know, over beers on that with me, I can talk for hours. Um, but I would like to talk initially a little bit more generally uh, about engineering. Uh, and I'm happy that I'm able to give this talk. This is the first time I'm giving this talk. Um, I'm happy I'm here in Europe doing that, because I think there's two different um, engineering cultures or traditions. So engineering sort of evolved differently um, in Europe and in America. And I'd like to talk a little bit at the beginning about um, the differences between the sort of European and American uh, traditions or cultures of engineering. And I think uh, to start off by talking about the, um, the European tradition, uh, I want to talk about these, these two men here. Uh, the man on the left is um, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier, and the man on the right is Pierre-Simon Laplace. Uh, and um, so does anyone study electrical engineering in college? Any electrical engineering majors in college? Wow. All right. So I bet that all the electrical engineering uh, majors in the university are very familiar with the names Fourier and Laplace, even though these two men didn't actually do research specifically in uh, electricity and magnetism. They contributed to mathematics and physics, but they didn't do work in electricity and magnetism directly. But um, now I studied computer engineering as an undergraduate at my school, computer engineering came out of the electrical engineering program, so it was really electrical engineering with some computer science sprinkled into the program. Um, and the reason uh, electrical engineers know all about Fourier and Laplace is because of these two equations. Um, the equation at the top is the Fourier transform, and the one on the bottom is the Laplace transform. Now, for um, I'm sure almost everyone here has heard of Fourier transforms. Uh, they have a lot of applications in, in the software world and things like um, audio processing and image processing. Um, so you know, Fourier transforms deal with basically sine waves, transforming a signal into sinusoids. Laplace transform is just a generalization of that. In addition to sinusoids, it handles um, you know, rising and, and falling exponentials. Um, and the reason that um, electrical engineers study Fourier and Laplace transforms is that they provide a very powerful mechanism for reasoning about the behavior of electrical circuits. So let's say you take an electrical circuit, you build it out of you know, resistors, capacitors, inductors, and, and even transistors. You know, we're used to, in, in the computer world, thinking about transistors as just being little switches that go on and off. But electrical engineers also use them as basically little, little amplifiers. You can actually run them in the middle, where they're not just acting like switches, but as filters or amplifiers. And it turns out that, um, so in general, if you have a big circuit, and you, you know, stick a voltage input on one side that varies over time, and you want to figure out what the output's going to look like uh, at another you know, two points in the circuit, uh, you've got to solve a series of um, differential equations. Um, but if you're, the pieces that you use to build the circuit are, are well behaved in a certain way, um, then you can actually describe the behavior of that circuit um, using what's called a transfer function, uh, which you can calculate using uh, Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms. And once you have the transfer function, you can basically figure out how that circuit will respond to any possible input. Uh, and so it's a very, very powerful mechanism for reasoning about the behavior of a system based on having a, a formal mathematical model of that system. And when I was a student, I, I loved this stuff. Um, it's, you know, if anyone ever asks you, why am I learning so much about polynomials or, or calculus, uh, you know, you can tell them you can actually, you know, reason about the behavior of circuits at some day. It's actually useful someday uh, to deal with polynomials and, and, um, and calculus. And so um, on the American um, tradition, um, I think is, is uh, well illustrated by these two men. These are uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright, um, more generally known as the Wright brothers. Um, and you probably uh, have heard of them. They're sort of credited with um, having the first um, airplane that um, was powered, that, you know, first heavier than air flight. Um, here's a picture of that, that initial flight. This is the Wright Flyer 1. Uh, I believe this is in 1903, flying in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on the east coast of the United States. Uh, this, this flight lasted about 12 seconds. 
Uh, it went 36 and a half meters. Um, you know, not, not a very great distance, but it was a very, very large accomplishment. Uh, now, these two men um, were not educated um, in a university in an engineering program. Uh, they were largely self-taught. They worked in a bicycle shop. They did, and they did a lot of experiments. They, they worked a lot with gliders to get the designs right. Um, it's not to say they didn't use any math at all. They did have, they used a, an equation to try to compute the lift that they needed on, on, to help them design the wings. But they, um, they really used a very sort of empirical, experimental approach to, to doing their designs. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, traditionally um, in America, that's how engineers um, became engineers. There wasn't, they didn't go through universities. Um, they were sort of learned on the shop floor or they learned in the field. Um, you know, you learn through apprenticeship. Whereas in, in Europe, you know, in the, um, you know, they called Polytechnique, developed in France, and students were educated, uh, you know, in mathematics and physics, and I believe even Laplace taught at, at, at you know, called Polytechnique. Uh, and it was more, you know, formal, theoretical, mathematical education that engineers got. Now, you know, over time, the European model won out over the American model. And there was some resistance in America. The engineers didn't think this math stuff was really useful. But, you know, ultimately today, all engineers in, in the United States um, go through either a you know a polytechnic school that model got imported into into America, or they you know, they go to a large university that has an you know an engineering program, and they learn a lot of, of mathematics and, and physics. So you know the European tr engineering tradition won out over the American one one over time. Now in software. Um, I think we still have the sort of the European and the American traditions, but there hasn't been a clear winner yet, and there's still sort of tension in that world. Now, so out of curiosity, how many people here, so I assume almost everyone here, you know, programs, how many people here do not have a computer-related degree? You don't have a degree in computer science or computer engineering or IT or software engineering. Okay, so, uh, you know, a non-trivial number, not, not, you know, majority, but you can still work in the field of software without being formally trained um, as, a, as a software engineer. And I think um, the tension in the software world between the, sort of the European and the American traditions is very well exemplified by these two men up here. Uh, I imagine many people in the audience will recognize the man on the left, uh, that's Edsger Dijkstra. The man on the right, uh, probably fewer people will recognize him by face, that's, that's Eric Ries. Um, so Dijkstra is you know, a very, very famous uh, Dutch computer scientist. Uh, if you did take computer science in undergraduate, I'm sure you've encountered Dijkstra's algorithm for computing the, um, the least cost path through a graph that has uh, weighted, weighted edges. Uh, you've probably also seen the dining philosopher's problem whenever you're reading a book on um, you know, multi-threading or concurrency, that Jackster came up with that. He did a lot of work in, in algorithms and programming languages and compilers and distributed systems and operating systems. Um, but one of the things he was really uh, passionate about was this idea of um, using sort of formal methods to develop software. And he wrote this book. Now, um, in general, the idea behind formal methods is that you have some kind of formal specification that describes how the software is supposed to behave. It's really like a sort of formal mathematical um, description of your of the software that you want to build, and then you you know you implement your code in some kind of implementation language like Java, and then you there's this verification step where you prove that the it, it, the, your code actually implements that formal specification. And, you know, Jagstra was a very, very uh, strong advocate of uh, the sort of formal approach. I think he describes, uh, you know, one way to do that in this book. And, you know, the idea of, of using formal methods to verify software is still very, very popular in universities here in Europe, much more so than in America. There's lots of research in formal methods um, and this sort of having this, this formal mathematical description of, of a you know, a software system. And you also see um, this sort of notion of a formal specification, you know, in computer science in Europe and research here in things like um, in um, functional programming language work, like, you know, Scala and, uh, you know, OCaml and Haskell. A lot of that work is done here in Europe, and a lot of that draws upon category theory from, from mathematics. There's also a lot of work done in what's called model-driven engineering, where you, you first create some formal specification, and then you actually generate the implementation um, from that spec. A lot of that, that model-driven work uh, is done here in, in Europe in, in uh, universities and in, in research. Now, Eric Ries, um, 
as I said, probably fewer people know him. He's a, you know, an entrepreneur, software engineer in America. Uh, he was the CTO of a company called IMVU, which is sort of a, like a 3D social network site. I don't know if anyone ever used Second Life a few years ago, but IMVU is kind of similar to that, where you have an avatar and you're, you're interacting in a 3D world with, with other people like that. Um, so Reese is not particularly well known for, for IMVU, um, but he is very well known for writing this book called The Lean Startup. Has anyone read this? Okay. Some people have read it. <coughs> so, um, the, so in The Lean Startup, he, he describes basically his ideas for how um, you should run a, a software-based startup. And the, the idea is that you're basically doing experiments, really. You're building very small things, and then you do an experiment to see what, you know, what's, what works well, and then based on the results of that experiment, you decide what to do next. So if you've ever heard the term minimum viable product, the idea where you, that you actually build you know, the, sort of the absolute smallest thing you can that has some value to a customer, um, that was popularized by Eric Ries. Or if you've heard the term pivot, where you know, the business model that your company is on right now um, you know, isn't going to be profitable and you should switch to something else. It was also, you know, popularized by, by Eric Ries. So, you know, Slack is an example of a company that pivoted where they're actually third out as a video game company that had, you know, like chat built in and they decided to extract the chat and make the business about that. Um, so you see, you know, Jaikstra on one hand and Reese on the other, there's this tension between the having, um, you know, reasoning about formal systems and the idea of sort of doing experimentation and trying and seeing what works. Um, in terms of engineering. Now, um, I'm talking today about chaos engineering, and that's very much in the American tradition of you know, empiricism and experimentation. Not necessarily having a formal model of the system you're, um, you're, you're trying to improve, but just trying things out and seeing what works and what doesn't. So I'm, uh, I work at Netflix. I'm a senior software engineer there. Um, I hope most of you have heard of us, but in case you haven't, uh, we are a, uh, an entertainment company. We stream um, video over the internet, movies and, and television. We make some of our own, uh, we produce some of our own uh, movies and TV shows, but we license a lot, uh, most of it from um, other uh, content providers. Uh, you know, you can watch us on smart TVs or on set-top boxes that plug into TVs like Apple TVs, on your phones and tablets and um, on your laptops and desktops. Now, um, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm under the team that deals with, uh, I'm on the traffic and chaos team and we sit under performance and reliability. Um, so one of our main goals to, is to, you know, achieve good reliability for Netflix. We are not a safety critical system like a, you know, nuclear power plant or something that controls a pacemaker. Um, nobody's going to die. Uh, or be physically harmed if Netflix goes down. Uh, and we're also not like infrastructure like a telecom company or even like a public cloud. Um, so we don't have those kinds of, of you know, availability requirements. But you know, on the other hand, um, people do get upset uh, when Netflix goes down. Right? Our, our, we're an entertainment company and people can't get their entertainment, they get, they get sad. Uh, and they like to talk about it on, on uh, Twitter. And you know, honestly, if we're not reliable enough, then people are going to stop subscribing to us and we're going to lose uh, customers that way. So we need to achieve some certain you know, threshold of reliability um, or we're going to lose, lose customers. Uh, one of the interesting challenges for us is that uh, if you know, we depend on uh, some third-party services for some things, and sometimes those are single points of failure for us, and when those go down, uh, even though it's not Netflix code that, that had a problem, um, we always somehow end up in the headlines um, because um, we're so big. So for example, you know, this is two outages that happened in the past uh, couple months. Uh, our DNS provider, UltraDNS, went down, and um, Amazon had a, an outage of their DynamoDB service, which affected their auto-scaling on the East Coast, and uh, we had a, a brief outage because of that. So when we go down, uh, everyone tells us about it. Uh, now, uh, so we want to achieve a high level of availability. Uh, and so I really like this quote from Jim Gray. Uh, Jim Gray is a um, computer scientist. Uh, he was an American, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, American computer scientist, he's a Turing Award winner. Uh, he won the Turing Award for work he did implementing ACID transactions in relational databases. Uh, and he wrote this great paper called what, Why Do Computers Stop and What Can Be Done About It? At the time, he was working for a company called Tandem Computers, which is now uh, owned by HP, which is now HPE. Um, and Tandem was a company that sold very reliable, fault-tolerant you know, computer systems. The kind, their customers were you know, like financial companies that were doing transaction processing or, or telecoms, you know, the stuff that couldn't, couldn't you know, go down. 
And this quote that I really like is, you know, a way to improve availability is to install proven hardware and software and then leave it alone. Right? So you, you know the hardware works, you know the software works, you put it out there and you don't touch it anymore. Now, um, for Netflix, this is not an option. We can't use this approach. Uh, on the hardware side, we run entirely on uh, Amazon's AWS cloud. Right? That was a business decision we made. We did not want to maintain data centers. That was not what we do. So we, we outsourced that to Amazon. But Amazon doesn't use the um, highest quality, you know, enterprise-grade hardware. Right? None of the cloud public cloud providers do that. They're, they're competing on cost. So they use commodity hardware. And it's up to the you know, software developers to you know, engineer redundancy at the software level, because you're not going to have it on the hardware level. And we run like thousands and thousands of virtual machines. And you know, disks fail quite often. And so there's always some you know, machine that's going to go down. So, so we can't do proven hardware. You know, we made a business decision. We're not going to spend the money on that. Um, and on the software side, um, you know, I, I can complain about Amazon, but really most of the outages at Netflix are self-inflicted. Um, and the reason is that we are very, very frequently making changes to our system. You know, uh, to stay competitive, we have to constantly be doing new development. And we do, I think, like thousands of changes to production every day. That could be like pushing new code or changing runtime configuration parameters that are picked up right away uh, and change the system. And that, that causes outages. Um, so I really like these couple of plots. This is a histogram that shows the distribution of uh, Netflix outages by, by days of the week. And you can see that there's a big drop off as you get to the weekend. And the reason is that because, you know, most people don't work on the weekends, they, they push code during the week. Uh, there's another plot um, that shows the distribution of outages uh, by hour of the day. And you can see this big you know, ramp up uh, at 9 o'clock, where people generally start to work, and then it, it tails off at the end of the day. Um, if you're wondering why it is there's a, like a dip at 11 o'clock, um, so Netflix, like many um, Silicon Valley companies, um, they pay for lunch for us. But we don't have a full service uh, kitchen in the cafeteria. So we get catered lunch. So it comes in, and it comes in at 11 o'clock. Right? That's when lunch comes. That's when everyone goes down to lunch. And so that's my, I haven't tested this, but I'm pretty sure that's why you see uh, a drop off in, um, in outages at, at lunchtime. Now, you know, it's a another business decision of the company is that we're not going to slow down the engineers to improve availability. We have to figure out ways of making the system more available without saying, you know, you can't push as often as you want. Um, and so that's one of the, the goals of my team on the traffic and chaos team. So. <laughs> I should be talking, right, while the pictures are being taken. Uh, here's a, a visualization of, of uh, a piece of the Netflix architecture. Um, this is a, a screenshot of a tool called uh, Flux that was developed mostly by um, one of my teammates, Justin Reynolds, which shows a visualization of, of basically um, traffic patterns inside of our architecture, how many um, calls are being made between different services. So Netflix has what people call now a microservice architecture. We have a whole bunch of different services that run on, on the Amazon cloud. So all of our services run inside of Amazon. The actual um, you know, video files themselves are served from a CDN, basically a big geographically distributed cache that's mostly at ISPs. But all the actual software services run inside of Amazon. We call that our control plane. Um, and so here you can see a visualization of the different software services. Um, each of the services is potentially operated by a totally separate engineering team. We don't have dedicated operations people, so the engineers are all responsible for managing their own, operating their own services. We do on-call rotations, so engineers are on-call for their, for their services if they're in the critical path. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting to me, getting to Netflix, I've only been there for five months, um, was that it's not possible to do an end-to-end -end integration test at Netflix. Um, we have a test environment. You can launch your services in the test environment, but you can't bring up the a replica of the production environment in test uh, and just run tests against that. In fact, you know, we don't even know what the architecture looks like in general. Right? That's why we need tools like this that introspect and do like sampling of requests to see what the architecture looks like right now. But there's no one person that actually even knows um, what the Netflix architecture uh, looks like. So we can't even do sort of the traditional you know, integration testing that, that you, know, you may have learned about or, or that you can do if you're you know, are, are working with a smaller system that didn't evolve the way ours did. So we have to have other ways of um, ensuring that the entire system uh, remains available. 
right? The engineers can test their individual services, but we need to know that the whole thing is working properly. So um, one of the uh, approaches that Netflix took was to build this tool called Chaos Monkey. This uh, was built several years ago, way before I was there. Uh, and what Chaos Monkey does is it basically tests to make sure that, this, that uh, all the services can handle um, virtual machine instances failing by going and randomly terminating virtual machine instances running on services in production. Right, so it runs. Um, it runs only during the week and only during work between like nine and three. Um, but it's on for, and you can opt out if you really want to. But it's on by default, and most people have it on. Um, and the reason is that the engineers are responsible for architecting redundancy into their services. Um, so they have to have multiple instances running, and they need to be able to implement, you know, check that their downstream services. Um, they can fall back and, and uh, you know, do timeouts and stuff like that. And the way to keep them honest is to basically constantly terminate instances and make sure that the system can handle it. And then if there's a problem, uh, you know, it happens during the day, and so it's, it's easier for people to fix uh, than it would be if you know, that Amazon you know, happens to terminate an instance at 2 in the morning because the, you know, one of the disks failed. And uh, you know, Chaos Monkey is really sort of an instantiation of this, uh, this concept that I think was really well uh, described uh, in this book, Continuous Delivery. Um, so this is a very, very popular book in the, in the DevOps world, uh, written by Jeff hum Jez Humble and Dave Farley, I believe it is. Uh, and what they said is basically, if something is difficult to do, um, then you should do it more and more often. And, and the, the reasoning is that if you do this more and more often, then the engineers are going to do what they have to do to reduce the pain. And for software, that's automation, right? So if you have, you know, if you're not doing continuous delivery, if, if you have like a, a manual, like, you know, nine step wiki page that describes how to deploy your app, and you force the engineers to keep doing it over and over and over again, eventually they're going to automate that darn thing. So they don't have to, you know, manually do that and, and run into typos and stuff like that. So, you know, Chaos Monkey is great for, you know, uh, dealing with problems that occur to a single virtual machine instance. But sometimes the, the failure domain is larger than that. Um, now, um, we run on Amazon, and Amazon, if you're not familiar with the way it's structured, Amazon's cloud, they run in multiple geographic regions. Uh, and Netflix services run basically in three of those regions. On, on the US East Coast, the data centers are in Northern Virginia. On one of the US West Coast data centers, which was in Oregon, and um, in Western Europe, in, in Ireland. So our services run in those three regions. And those regions basically run independently, except for like, the database layer, which has to be replicated. And Netflix, the clients of the Netflix services basically are routed to whichever region is closest to them um, to you know, reduce the latency. Now, sometimes we have an outage in a, in a region. It could be because uh, of Amazon. Sometimes Amazon has a, a region where it's not, it's not very common. But sometimes something will go wrong in an Amazon region. Or sometimes you know, we'll do some bad code push. And we make sure we don't push to everything at once. We push to one region at a time. And if there's something goes wrong and we can't roll back, uh, for whatever reason, then we want to be able to handle that situation. And so what we can do in Netflix um, is we can redirect the traffic. Um, so if there's a problem with, um, say, Europe, then we can redirect those requests from Europe to the East Coast. Um, at least we think we can, right? We have a mechanism for doing that, but we need to make sure all the time that that actually works, because there might have been some change that we don't know that's broken that. So we run what are called these Chaos Kong exercises, and that's why that that, that's Kong over there. Uh, so once a month, we will shift all of the traffic uh, outside, we'll evacuate one of the regions, shift all the traffic to one or two of the other regions, and make sure everything's working properly. And then we'll hold it there for about a day or so, uh, and then we'll shift it back. And so we have to do these drills, we haven't fully automated this, but we have to do these drills once a month to make sure that everything is still working properly, that we can, that we can actually recover from that. So Chaos Monkey and Chaos Kong are, are two of the ways we're you know, trying to ensure we're, we can achieve high availability. We also have other approaches. We have like a failure injection testing framework where we can do things like cause um, a request from one service to another to selectively fail, maybe for some percentage of users or particular ones, or we can add latency or things like that. So we can run these kinds of experiments to make sure that fallbacks work correctly. If the cache goes away, then the database can handle things, stuff like that. And what we've been trying to do more recently is, is kind of systemize our approach. Um, and we're calling that chaos engineering. And the truth is that you know, Netflix is not the only company doing these sorts of things. We're just the ones that like to talk about it the most. And the reasons we like to talk about it the most is because that we see 
the sort of public outreach stuff that we do, these talks and the you know, open source stuff, as, as a mechanism for recruiting. We want people to say, hey, Netflix is a cool company. Uh, I want to work there. And that's why, that's why you know, we have a lot of incentive to tell people what we're doing. But you know, we talk to other large tech companies, and they're doing similar kinds of things. And what we'd like to do is build a community around um, this approach. And we're calling it chaos engineering. And so in a nutshell, um, you know, if we boil it down to one sentence, this is what chaos engineering is. It's really about doing experiments, uh, and it's doing experiments on a production system. And, and the motivation is we want to have confidence that the system is working properly. And we want to basically have confidence that it can take whatever it is that you know, the world might throw at it. Right? So we, we throw things at the system, and we do experiments, and we make sure it, you know, that it behaves the way we expect it to. And if it does, great. You know, we, we believe today that it's still working properly. Um, and if it doesn't, then we need to figure out what went wrong and, and go and, and fix it. So um, we have a set of uh, principles of chaos engineering. These are not you know, laws, but these are sort of guidelines for designing the kinds of experiments that you can do to improve the availability of a system like ours. Um, and to talk about the first um, principle, I need to first talk about this graph. Um, this is a graph that's called, uh, we call it SPS. So lots of engineers look at this graph at Netflix. And basically, uh, every time uh, a Netflix customer hits the play button and successfully is able to stream a video, you can think of us, you know, conceptually as incrementing a counter, and you reset that each second. So this tells us how many streams successfully start um, every second. And we look at this plot because this tells us that basically if Netflix is working or not. Because if people can stream video, still stream video, then it's working enough, right? There may be some failures in some places. Maybe the, you know, the recommendation system is not working perfectly or something. But people are able to watch video. And if that goes to zero, then we have a huge problem. But if it's not, we think it's generally OK. And, and you can see this is a, a, a plot of SPS um, that's plotted over several days. And you can see there's sort of a natural rise and fall, right? Um, it's sort of bottoms out somewhere around you know, 3 a.m. And, and tops out around, around 6 p.m. So there's a, there's a natural variation that we expect because people watch you know, more, more videos in the, you know, in the evening than they would you know, in the middle of the day. Um, and you also see um, there's sort of a black and red line that is superimposed on each other. And what we do when we look at these graphs is that we, you know, we plot it for this week, and then we, we plot last week's uh, superimposed on top of it. And the reason is that we don't see much variation week to week in this graph. And so we can quickly see if the, today's plot is deviating from last week's, then that means that probably there's an issue, that there's something we need to be aware of. Now, I think most companies have some kind of dashboard like this. Or, or if you don't, you really um, should have something like this that tells you like the current health of your system um, based on some you know, business indicator, not necessarily like you know, CPU usage or memory or something like that, but something that's meaningful. Um, and it really describes how the system is behaving over time. And this is the thing that we look at uh, when we design our experiments. We ask, you know, what's the effect going to be on SPS? And hopefully it's usually zero. Um, and so that brings us to the first of the principles, which is when you're, when you're building these experiments, you're, all, you're, you're starting with a hypothesis, right? You think, well, what, it, you know, um, what's going to happen? What do I think is going to happen when I inject something into the system? And generally, the hypothesis should be around the steady state behavior of the system. You should have some characterization of how your system behaves. Um, and you should have some idea when you inject the thing that you're injecting, what's going to happen. Now, you know, if you think of Chaos Monkey as an experiment, our hypothesis is that SPS is not going to be affected. Uh, Chaos Kong as well. The idea is that when we shift traffic or terminate one instance, we're not going to see any drop in, um, in the number of people who are able to stream videos. And if we do, there's a problem. Now, you may have some experiments where you do see some change. So, uh, you know, if we design an experiment where we, where we want to degrade the Netflix service for a subset of customers just to see if it'll actually still work in a degraded mode, then we may expect, I don't know, like a 20% reduction or something like that. Um, and so it's not always the hypothesis is that there's no effect, but um, generally speaking, you know, most of our experiments are like that, that we think that what we do, our system can handle it and the, the customer won't be um, directly impacted. All right, for the second one, this is the happy path. Is anyone familiar with the happy path? All right, many people. Uh, so the happy path is that, is that 
trace a uh, path through your, your, uh, your code where um, nothing bad happens, right? Where all of your input that comes from the outside world is well formed um, and all of the responses from third party services is, is okay, no errors. None of your API calls fail. Uh, there's no exceptions ever thrown, right? When you're first writing your code and writing your tests, you're usually testing the happy path first, right? Because that's the functionality of your code. Um, but the problem is that generally when bad things happen, uh, in production, it's because of things that did happen off the happy path. And it's generally because we usually test the happy path first, right? That's what we're, we do is that's just our sort of instinct as, as software developers. We don't think about the other things that can happen. But, um, and so that brings us to the second one. But, but bad things happen in the world, right? Or unexpected things happen. Hard disks fill up, we run out of memory, um, garbage collection happens in inconvenient times, um, packets are lost, or, you know, um, responses fail, sometimes like there's a huge latency in a response. Um, if you do postmortems on your outages, I'm sure you have like a very rich source of, of history about the kinds of bad things that can happen to your system um, that can cause outages. And they're not all necessarily, you know, a transient failure. Sometimes it can be like a, an unexpected spike in traffic. Um, that your system might not be able to handle. But the idea is when you're designing these kinds of chaos experiments, what you want to think of is, you know, what could the world possibly throw at my system? Um, and use those as sort of the stimulus, as the treatment um, in your experiments to, um, w when you're designing them. Uh, so for the third one, um, so recently I've been reading this book called um, Engineering Progress Through Trouble. So this is a book that was uh, written in the 70s, and it's actually a collection of case studies uh, from mechanical engineering about um, basically design challenges that engineers had because of some kind of failure somewhere. Uh, and one of the, the interesting chapters is on ocean engineering. And it, it turns out that the ocean is a really harsh environment for, for building systems in, uh, right? Like the seawater is really, really salty and that uh, is really bad for certain metals. Uh, and in one of the case studies, they talked about this uh, patrol boat that had a, a propeller shaft that was made of high strength steel. And the problem was that the high strength steel was being corroded by the seawater and then the propeller shaft would fail. And so one of the things that the engineers tried to do uh, to compensate for this was to use nickel plating on the propeller shaft because apparently nickel doesn't, uh, doesn't react to seawater the same way that, that steel does. A and presumably that worked you know, fine in the lab. Um, they nickel plated the, um, the propeller shafts. They, they put these you know, patrol boats out to sea. And what happened was when the, when the boats were moored, um, barnacles would attach to the propeller shaft and the chemistry of the barnacles was such that they would cause these crevices to appear on, on the nickel. So uh, there's something about barnacles that sort of eats away at, at nickel. Um, and so there was little crevices, little holes on the nickel plating and the seawater basically got in those crevices and corroded the steel and uh, caused that, that propeller shaft to fail again. So that was sort of a, uh, a failure. Um, that, that approach didn't work. And that brings us to the, the third uh, principle, which is that there's always those darn barnacles uh, in production, right? There's always these things that, that you're not going to be able to predict when you're running in your test environment that are going to happen in production. You may be able to get your test environment very, very close. Uh, and the closer you can, the better. But um, if you can, the, the, the best thing to do is to actually run these in, in, you know, directly in production. And I know that can sound scary, but if you think your system is designed, can handle the things you're throwing at it, then you really have to test it. Uh, and I can tell you that like, eventually people uh, will adapt to this, right? And you can actually, you know, you can design your systems to reduce the failure domains in production. You can use things like canaries. Um, and, you know, when you run your experiments, you can restrict the amount of people that, you know, of requests that are going to be involved in the experiment, right? So if you have good enough infrastructure, then you can have some confidence that, you know, you can do these kinds of experiments. You should be able to roll back quickly, right? All these things that I'm saying you should be able to do anyways, right, to build highly available systems. So um, I know not everyone's going to be able to run in production, but the closer you can get to this, the better. And the, the last principle is uh, really about automation, that, that whole idea of, of, of bringing the pain forward. And the, uh, the motivation for this is that because you know, these kinds of systems change so much over time, um, the more time that passes, 
uh, between uh, when you run an experiment and, and now, the less confidence you can have that the results still hold. Right? You've got to keep doing them over and over again to make sure your system can still withstand that. That's why we run Chaos Monkey all the time. That's why we run our Chaos Kong drills all the time. Because you know, any change uh, can, can break things. And so um, if you can automate them, that's really, really great. Uh, so just to recap on, on what these principles are, and the first one is the idea of having some notion of the steady state behavior of your system and hypothesizing how your experiment's going to affect the steady state. The second one is about how, you know, what kinds of stimulus, what kinds of treatments that you apply to the system. You want to you throw things at the system that you know, your system might actually encounter, so real world kinds of things. Um, the third one is to actually you know, run your ex experiments right on your production system rather than just running them in test. And the fourth one is to automate when you can. So once you've got your experiment up and running, just run it continuously. Um, so you can have confidence that your, your system is still going to be available. So as I said earlier, um, we're trying to build a, you know, a community of practice around this. Um, so you can go to uh, principlesofchaos.com and you can see some more details about, uh, about these principles. If you want to hear what kind of stuff we're doing at Netflix you know, with chaos or with you know, our open source stuff or, or any of the other things, you can go to our tech blog. Um, if you are interested in this stuff in, in chaos, we're, as I said, we're trying to build a community. Send us an email at chaos at netflix.com. The goal is to you know, eventually have things like meetups and, and conferences where um, we can exchange information about you know, what works, how do you get things adopted um, in your organization, you know, what kind of tooling is available, things like that. So I, I apparently speak really quickly. So. Uh, we're quite early, so I, I've got time for questions if anyone has any, uh, any questions to ask me. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that you have a bunch of microservices that you can bring down and easily, like the recommendation system. Um, so if you would have your, you know, your big framework and you have like a bunch of microservices, some can fall out, some cannot, but you would still say that you will still have like one point of failure, which is like you know, the, the entry portal. How, how do you sort of cope with that? So I don't quite understand. So you said we, we still have one point of failure, the... Well, yeah, you know, once you want to log in, right? So your login screen might be your single point of failure, or like just the portal framework of that is Netflix. Oh, well, so, uh, so we asked, is there, you know, even with the system where certain services can fail, you still have single points of failure. Um, and an, an example he gave was the, was the, um, the login service. So there's, so there's a couple of things. So we do certainly have a set of services that are critical services that if it's not that in fact I think we call them like tiers now um, there's certain services where if, if all those instances went down um, then, the, then the system would you know people would not be able to log it, stream video like the the SPS would go to zero if some services were, were out it, they can withstand individual instance terminations but there are some services that are that are critical those services themselves have to have redundancy so we run multiple you know they sit behind the load balancer and we can shift between regions but there are still some services you know you talk about login typically users don't log in that much so you know they log in and then that token lasts for a while um, but new users wouldn't be able to um, log in if they, if they hadn't logged so if, if the login service went down. Uh, and there are, there are, so there are critical services, we can't get around that, but we can build redundancy. Um, so they're in different regions and you know, within the service there's different um, virtual machines that are, that are running that service. Yeah? Um, I think that failures are not always so unrelated with each other as you wish. So if you say that there is server A and server B running the same whatever, then uh, you have 1% chance that this fails and 1% this, and it's not one ten thousandth of a chance that both fail, but it's more, because it's somehow they have the same hardware, the same firmware, same software, whatever. Yeah, so, uh, so he brings up the issue that failures are not independent, um, and that they can be correlated. And that's very true. And I think you know many outages in complex systems are because uh, are are because of coincident failures, and usually some kind of soft failure too. It's not like it goes off or not, but it operates in some sort of degraded mode. Um, I would say I would love for us to be better at doing that kind of failure modeling uh, to figure out how do we you know simulate those kinds of failures where you have correlated issues. Um, I, so I would sort of say that's an open problem. I, I believe that's true. I, I think we need to get better at, at at injecting those kinds of, of correlated failures when we do our testing. Hmm. 
All right. Well, if there's no more questions, that's it.